All right. Well, good evening and welcome to this You Catholic webinar presented by the Core Project, the Theology of the Body Institute, the Culture Project, and the Sunrise Morning Show. My name is Anna Mitchell, and I'll be uh, hosting you tonight for this webinar, and we're really happy to have you along. And I thought uh, I might start with a prayer. It's a well-worn holy card of Pope John Paul II. So uh, let's begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O oh, Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for the life of Pope St. John Paul II and his extraordinary service of love, faith, and guidance. Grant us the vision to light the way for others with the same deep faith and love that Pope John Paul II showed daily in his life. Let our actions resemble his generous and humble ways. Through his intercession, we pray for all our needs. He lives now in the light of your love for he dedicated himself unselfishly in the service of your holy name. Grant us the favors we ask through Pope St. John Paul II's intercession. Amen. Pope Amen. John Paul II, pray for, pray us. for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So once again, my name is Anna Mitchell. I am the news director and producer of the Sunrise Morning Show, which you can hear from 6 to 7 a.m. on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. And we've got a Sunrise Morning Show app if you want to tune in to all three hours of our program. And really excited for our panel today, a very prestigious panel that I will introduce right now. And uh, we'll do ladies first. Christina Barba is the president International. Christina and several of her, her colleagues founded the Culture Project with a vision to restore culture through the experience of virtue. The Culture Project proclaims the dignity of the human person and the richness of living sexual integrity through the witness and presentations of young missionaries. Christina received honorable mention by our Sunday visitor as one of the inspiring Catholics of 2012. That was back when she was serving as executive director of Generation Life. Christina, thanks so much for being here tonight. Thank you for having me, Anna. Christopher West is president of the CORE Project, which is a global membership and outreach organization helping others to learn, live, and share John Paul II's Theology of the Body. He also serves as senior lecturer at the Theology of the Body Institute, and his courses there attract students from around the world. He is the best selling author of multiple books and video programs, and his work has been featured in the New York Times, on ABC News, Fox News, MSNBC, and countless Catholic and evangelical media outlets. Christopher, welcome to the panel. Thanks, Anna. Happy to be with you. And Damon Owens, last but not least, is executive director of the Theology of the Body Institute, whose mission, again, is to educate and train men and women to understand, live, and promote the Theology of the Body and he's a national trainer for Ascension Press. Damon keeps a full international speaking schedule at conferences, marriage seminars, universities, high schools, seminaries, and parishes on the good news of marriage, sexuality, theology of the body, theology of the family, adoption, and natural family planning. Damon, it's good to see you. Good to see you, Anna. Great to be with everybody. And I understand both you and Christopher will be presenting at the World Meeting of Families. Is that right? T minus one. Four days, five days. Yeah. Very close. Awesome. Very cool. We'll have to, um, at some point, uh, you guys will have to tell us a little bit about what you'll be presenting. But let's just jump right in here and talk about the theology of the body and kind of start off, uh, Damon, if you would, by basically you know, telling us what is theology of the body and, and what does it teach us about sex? Well, first of all, congratulations on such a great title, Sex, Saints, and Salvation. Uh, <laughs> one of those uh, tip-of-the-spear conversations for the culture to get into the theology of the body. Well, uh, begin in the beginning, what we call the theology of the body really is a, a recompilation of a manuscript that St. John Paul II had written from 1974 to about 1977-78 well, before he was elected pope. And uh, being told in no uncertain terms that popes don't write books, it's funny to us now, but uh, kind of a precedent that he took the, uh, the manuscript and basically divided it into 129 short talks that he gave to all people of goodwill, literally, uh, at the, the balcony of the people at St. Peter's Basilica on the square. Uh, it was a highly theological, highly philosophical, but we received it as talks. This is why we refer to them as audiences. 
and much for many for decades, those were known uh, from translations that were done real time and a few here or there, thanks to the work of the Observatory Romano and the Daughter St. Paul. But it wasn't until 2006, I believe, that um, Professor Mikhail Waldstein really did some real research to recompile uh, what John Paul had originally written in the manuscript, uh, going back uh, not only to interview people that were still alive, but to really get the, the text. And Christopher, in fact, was involved in some of that with Dr. Waldstein and visiting Krakow and Karnal Zivitz, his, uh, his secretary, and getting firsthand uh, what was he getting at here or there. And there were so many translations. So we owe a lot to Dr. Waldstein in giving us what we have today. And we call it Theology of the Body, this beautiful compilation, uh, not because it was named by anyone else, but because, in fact, John Paul II had re referred to this body of work in several different ways over 52 times in the text as the theology of the body. Uh, that's what it is. Uh, what it says is that it, um, there is a truth about the human person that really is the foundational question that must be asked before we can answer any questions about how we live our life, uh, what truly matters, and really it's a theology because we come to know God, the study of God, in creation. What did he create? What does he reveal to us? And the crowning achievement of creation is the human person made male and female. In the opening paragraphs of the very first book, the very first chapter of our scriptures, Genesis, all the way through Revelation is really about the origin, the history, and the destiny of man, the human person. And the theology of the body, remember, this is in the 70s, it's in the wake of the 60s, and it follows decades of his own personal and professional work in really getting to the mystery of the human person. So the great power of theology of the body is not just that it's narrowly about sex, as we'll talk about that, uh, it's not just about the saints. It's not just about salvation. It's about everything. And in order to get to any of those important areas, we have to first begin in the beginning. Uh, who are we? Then we can answer the question, how do we live our lives to be true? Damon, I think we lost you there. Are you there? Anybody else here, Damon? I didn't hear no. the last few things that Damon said, no. Just miss Damon, that. talk. Did you mute yourself, Damon? I didn't. Did something happen? Oh, I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> there you go. Was I talking to myself again? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Just for a little bit. Just, just the last sentence or two. <laughs> oh, because I was talking some good stuff to myself. I hope oh, somebody man. else heard that. So rewind <laughs> about two sentences and repeat. <laughs> yeah, that's something I'm not real good at. Just to say that in order to get to these profound questions of, of, of life, which everyone asks, anyone who's awake, anyone looking for, for a life of significance and a joy, we're asking these questions, and John Paul is proposing to us that the answer to these lies in first unpacking the knowledge and the, the depth and truth of the human person in order for us to see the fullness of God himself. Thank you. Um, I forgot to mention, by the way, that uh, we are taking questions. I'll be monitoring uh, the question panel. You can uh, you can type your questions to me, and I'll uh, try to get through them as best I can at the end of the webinar. And then also, thanks to the Belmont Abbey uh, students who are here joining us today, uh, they asked if they could tweet questions. And um, at first, I didn't think it was possible, and then I realized I actually own a smartphone and you know, can follow Twitter on my smartphone. So if you want to tweet questions at me, if you're in a group watching this, uh, my Twitter handle is at Morning Anna, Morning Anna, and, um, and you can hashtag it TOB, and I'll try to monitor my Twitter feed as well. We'll see how well I'm doing at, you know, all this multitasking. But uh, moving on here, Christopher, I wanted to um, ask you, you know, what does theology of the body really say about the deeper longings in the human heart? Theology of the body, as Damon aptly said, is not just about sex. What it really gives us is what John Paul II calls an adequate anthropology. That means a, a full understanding of what it means to be human. And the human being is defined by what the fathers of the church called the kapax dei, and that means the capacity for God. And we experience the, this capacity for God in our deepest longings and desires. So, you know, turn on the radio, and you're going to hear this cry of the human heart. Everybody's looking for something. I think Bruce Springsteen said it best. Everybody's got a hungry heart. Who can't relate to that? We feel this ache. We feel this longing. 
the catechism begins its whole presentation of the Catholic faith with the reflection on desire and helping us to recognize that the desire we all feel, that thing we're looking for, is the infinite. It's God. And that longing has a name. It's called, the Greeks called it anyway, eros, E-R-O-S, that cry of the heart for the infinite. It's the erotic longing of the heart. Tragically, that word erotic has gotten all twisted up by our perverse sexual revolution. I put it this way. I like to say God gave us eros, that longing of the heart, that power that, that John Paul II calls it in love and responsibility, this sexual urge. He says this longing, this hunger, God gave it to us, here's my own image, to be like the fuel of a rocket that has the power to launch us towards the stars. But what would happen if those rocket engines became inverted? No longer pointing us to the stars, but pointing us back on ourselves. Set that rocket off, and you're going to have a massive blast of self-destruction. That's the sexual revolution in a nutshell. John Paul II's theology of the body is an invitation to open our hearts to the grace of redemption, which redirects our rocket engines towards the stars. So it's important to understand, a lot of people think, if we're going to use this imagery, that Christ comes into the world to say, rocket bad, rocket evil, run away from the rocket. No, 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 no. Christ comes into the world to redeem the rocket, to redirect those desires according to God's design so we can reach our destiny. And that's what Theology of the Body is all about. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Christina, uh, how do you see this in your work with the Culture Project playing out this, the deeper longings of the human heart as, as pointed out in Theology of the Body? How do you see that playing out in the culture at large? Sure. Well, I mean, in a world that is so tired and, and jaded and cynical and skeptical and um, not trusting of religion or faith or anything like that. We have a whole, whole planet full of people that are, are confused, are uncertain, that have these deep longings and desires but don't know where to look, don't know where to go, don't know who to trust. And the, the beautiful thing about our, our faith is that, I mean, this is, there's timeless teachings and principles and things that go back forever. But people are afraid of it, or they, they're not trusting, or they're skeptical. But the theology of the body is just, um, it opens up the door, and it makes these beautiful, timeless teachings of the church, I think, truly accessible. Accessible to people that are tired and um, hurt and jaded. Um, it, by addressing like the natural rhythm of things, by addressing nature and man and woman, male and female, by addressing the beautiful sexual drive, all the things that Christopher was speaking about, Dan was speaking about, by addressing those things and pointing out the truth, it's, it's a way to share the gospel, actually. It's a way, a way to evangelize. It's a way to bring order and truth to people that aren't so trusting. Um, I really think it's, it's a way that cross-culture, cross-country, cross-religion, cross-faith, just by speaking about the truth of the body, the goodness of the body, the truth of love, those realities, we can reach the multitudes. And, and quite honestly, there's something that's just, it's, it's missing in longing. And actually, I'll, I won't never forget being a university student and first encountering the theology of the body. Actually, Christopher, through those awesome CDs that you put out that probably now you look back because you know, we always make things better and better, but they were so phenomenal. And I'll never forget for the first time hearing these things that deep in my heart, I, I knew and I, I was raised in a, a, a beautiful home, great parents that, that taught me well. And I always felt like I was the only one that wanted to live out these teachings, but I felt strange and I felt isolated. And, I, and even in, in, a, in Catholic schools, I was like sort of the weird one, the only one, the chastity girl, you know? And, um, and, and then hearing these things are articulated in a way that they address like the deeper longings of the human person in such a natural way, in such a raw, natural way, presenting Jesus Christ and the gospel and the goodness of the church through such simple things as, as love and the human body and male, female, marriage, all of those things, it, it really uh, opened up for me so much. And then it was something that I could so easily and simply share, actually, with my friends, with my roommates, with those that were 
Catholics or not Catholics, practicing or not, with those that were atheists. Um, and, and I just, I, I saw it explode, you know, when things would, would make sense in people's minds and hearts and things would connect. Um, it, it gave them like a new order, a, a belief, a belief that there's something more, um, a belief that they belong, that maybe they are the way they are for a reason, that there actually is some order, some purpose, some truth in life. Because I think those things have really been lost. And as Damon started us all out, it goes back to I identity and dignity. And people don't know who they are anymore, but they want to know. We, we all want to know. We all long to know. Well, you know, Christina, we were talking, um, you were a guest of mine on the Sunrise Morning Show the other day, and uh, you said something that I thought was really poignant that I'm hoping you might reflect on for a second here before uh, we move on, is that living a life of virtue and living a life of sexual purity um, really makes you more human. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, again, going back to pe people think of religion and um, things like rules and things that repress you. And um, but but really, we all it's, it's the manual, the, the guideline, the, the way that we're all meant to live. And I think when you actually strive to live virtue and, and purity and, and all virtue, it actually makes you more who you were meant to become. It actually truly humanizes you. It gives you the, the correct perspective. The, it gives you, um, you know, a way to make choices and, and something that helps you live out your life. It helps you to experience just the, the it helps you to kind of categorize the experience that you're having. Excellent. Now, um, Christopher, uh, how is theology of the body connected to the saints? Well, it's written by a saint to begin with. <laughs> So well, that was an easy one. Uh, that's, that's the starting point. But John Paul II, it's so important we understand theology of the body didn't fall out of the sky in the 20th century in the lap of Carol Wojtyla, who became John Paul II. It is building on 2,000 years of Christian reflection on the meaning of human embodiment, human sexuality, human existence. So you can't understand the theology of the body in a vacuum. John Paul II drew extensively from the works of great saints, Thomas Aquinas, uh, St. Augustine, uh, St. John of the Cross. John of the Cross is a big one. John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila, in fact. And the whole mystical tradition that understands spousal love as the key to the whole Christian mystery. So what John Paul II is giving us here, he's really helping us see that the spousal theology of the church is... is impressed by God right in our bodies. And what do I mean by that? You can summarize the whole Bible and 2,000 years of Christian reflection on it with five words. Here it is. God wants to marry us. All, all the great saints and mystics of our tradition understand the spousal imagery of the scriptures as the key to understanding the whole story. The Bible begins with the marriage of man and woman. Throughout the Old Testament, God speaks of his love for his people as the love of a husband for his bride. In the New Testament, the love of the eternal bridegroom is literally embodied when the word is made flesh. Skip to the end of the story. The book of Revelation describes heaven as a marriage, the marriage of Christ and the church. Look at the bookends here. We start with the marriage of man and woman in the Bible. We end with the marriage of Christ and the church. And all the saints for 2,000 years have been telling us that these two bookends of the Bible give us the key that unlocks the whole story. God wants to marry us. And St. John Paul II helps us understand in the theology of the body that our bodies tell this story. Here's some other saint connections. It goes right back to St. Paul, Ephesians chapter 5. This is the key passage in all of Scripture for understanding the theology of the body, where he links... The one flesh union of Genesis, the first book end of the Bible, with the final book end of the Bible, the marriage of Christ and the church, when he says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his bride, and the two will become one flesh. And then he adds, this is a great mystery. This is a great mystery. Our creation as male and female and the call of the two to become one is a great mystery, and it refers to Christ and the church God loves us, God wants to marry us, and we all know first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes the baby in the baby carriage. God wants to fill his bride with eternal life. 
And this is not just a metaphor. This is not just poetry. And here's the saint of all saints and the connection between the saints and the theology of the body. We go to, we got to go to Mary because Mary is the saint who gave theology a body, if you will. She is, as the fathers of the church say, she is the mystic bride of love eternal. She said yes to God's marriage proposal, representing all of humanity, and she conceived the Son of God, giving God flesh. That, the incarnation, and the fact that the Word became flesh through Mary, that is what justifies the whole idea that our bodies are theological. You know, I think it's interesting. Thing. It's such a safe way to look at God's love when we look at him as a father. And of course, he has that fatherly love for us. But don't you think it, it makes people a little bit uncomfortable, Christopher, don't you think, when, when we think of God as loving us like a lover? Why does it make us uncomfortable? Only because our understanding of the intimacy of spousal love has been so skewed. You know, mm -hmm. even when I say the word eros, uh, we get the English word erotic, as I said earlier, that word erotic has been so twisted by the enemy and the distortions of a pornographic culture. But we must, must, must hold on to this truth and hold on tightly. The devil does not have his own clay. All he can do is take God's clay and behold, God looked at everything he made and said, it is very good. The devil takes God's clay and twists it and distorts it right in the middle of the Bible is this glorious, erotic love poetry. And if we want to make, again, the connection with the saints, the saints, by, by far, the favorite book in the Bible of the saints throughout the centuries has been the Song of Songs. Mm -hmm. And the saints have written more commentaries on this erotic love poetry in the Bible than any other book in the Bible, more than the Gospels, more than Paul's letters. The saints have written about the Song of Songs. Why? Because they understand, just as Pope Benedict XVI said, that the Song of Songs expresses the essence, the very essence of biblical faith. What is the essence of biblical faith? We can enter into spousal union with the divine. We are destined, we are created, and we yearn for this eternal union. What Teresa of Avila, here she is, Teresa of Avila in ecstasy, she called this experience of ecstasy and union with God, she called it, you know, looking for words, striving to find some words to put her experience in words. She said, it's, it's nuptial union, nuptial union with the Lord. If we find it difficult to apply this imagery to God, then it's not the imagery that is at fault. It's our own impurity and the, the lies and distortions, what I call pornographic interference. Because the enemy, the enemy is after our sexuality specifically, so we can't see the real story our bodies tell. If he can twist and disorder our understanding of sexuality, we will no longer understand the key that opens the whole mystery of God, the call to union with God forever that's stamped right in our sexuality. Oh. Amen. If I could just add something beautiful to that, Chris, it's just that we're not Anna, caught in the situation where we have to choose between our filial, our love for the Father and for the spousal uh, eternity. In fact, it's that very uh, Father at receiving ourselves as sons and daughters that is the untwisting. It's restoring yes. back to that original order of original solitude that we read in the dense poetry of Genesis 2 in the very beginning that Adam experienced before Eve. And before we can be spouse, we have to first be son or daughter. Then we have to be friend. Then we have to be spouse, and then we become father, mother. So, in a great, beautiful, both and Catholic tradition, we're not forced to choose. We're supposed to look at them in their right perspective. And John Paul is offering a phrase he used: a, a vector of aspiration. You know, to aspire not only to who we are, but to become what we are. And that sonship and that daughtership is, is step one. We need to know who we are uh, in that divine relationship, so that we can mature to be capable. Of being a spouse and the connection there is so important between the spousal reality and as Damon said that the fatherly and motherly grows out of that how do you become a father or mother through spousal love right so this mm -hmm. this whole mystery is stamped right in our bodies and when we separate spousal love from paternal love or maternal love we're in big trouble and that's where we are in the culture today 
we don't understand the meaning of our sexuality because we've separated sexuality from fertility. And maybe we can talk about this later in the program, but that, that's a very, very important issue that these two realities are related, closely related. Definitely. Christina, I want to bring you into this, um, talking about the saints. How can we use the saints as examples in our own lives to live out this call to holiness? Sure. Well, something that I love about the theology of the body, which I was trying to articulate earlier, I don't think I did so well, is that it is just so concrete and tangible. And one of the beautiful things about the saints, something that I really love, is that they can be those concrete examples for us. So they were regular men and women, just like you and I, and they made it. Like, they were regular, weak, pathetic, broken men and women, and they actually, they did it. They made it. Um, so, and I, I think there are so many, I mean, so many saints that we can we can look to, and as uh, Christopher pointed out, I mean, Theology of the Body is written by a, a saint, so um, that's pretty darn neat. So, I mean, even just looking at John Paul II's life, I mean, he in, in and of himself is such a teacher just through his life, and I think it's so beautiful how uh, a man who lived celibacy uh, really loved human love. And I think that just, it just is so beautiful. He fell in love with human love. And it's beautiful to like read his life and to, to look at that and to look to him as, as an example. Um, a couple of the saints that we at the Culture Project really love and look up to. So obviously John Paul II, uh -huh. St. Maria Goretti, and also Pier Giorgio Frassati. So St. Maria Goretti, um, Many, many of you know her story, and um, just a, a beautiful young woman that, that died. And she's often known for dying to preserve her purity, but there's actually like a, a really a deeper reasoning behind that. She actually um, died, yes, preserving her purity, but truly wanting the, the other, her attacker, to not commit a sin, to not commit a moral sin. So there's this beautiful, under, deeper understanding that it's not just um, just just the, the body that it goes goes deeper. And so anyway, her story of, of purity, of courage, and of actual love um, for her for her brother, who obviously didn't even fully comprehend and, and live out all of these virtues, is really powerful. And then the story of for, forgiveness too, um, all wrapped up in there. So I think she's such a, a great saint to look to, especially um, in in light of our culture and the the way things are skewed with sexuality. Um, there's like in that story, there's different players. And so there was someone that understood and reverenced their dignity and their purity, and then there was someone that didn't. But there's hope at the end of that, and there's redemption for all involved in that story. So I think it's a very, very great poignant story, especially for our very broken culture today. And then uh, Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati is just someone that I'm a huge fan of. Um, he also died very young, and it was just an example of such a great single layman and I think he's so powerful because he, um, so often we can get caught on the end game and caught on, well, not really the end game, the in-between end game. So caught on our vocation. Um, am I to be married? Am I to be a priest? Am I to be religious? What am I to do? And, and he, well, if he would have waited to get into his permanent vocation, he would have lost his chance at sanctity. And so he was a, a single lay man that lived life to the fullest. And he also is one of those people that, really was an example of that um, of, of virtue humanizing, I think. So he was just a regular, fun, rugged man that went mountain climbing and smoked pipes and, you know, had parties with his friends, but didn't see a contradiction. And he was fully, fully, fully alive. And so, um, and then naturally by doing that, that means he, he had an understanding of, of truly of the theology of the body. Because, I mean, these things all, they all go, they all go together. They all go hand in hand. And I think when you know your dignity, you know your value, you know your worth, you strive then to become a more virtuous person. And you really do that becoming more a female or more a male because we are created male and female and will be redeemed male and female. So anyway, Pier Giorgio, Maria Gretti, John Paul II, they're, they're three of, of my go-tos and they're three of the saints that I see really resonate with the youth of today in terms of concrete examples of, of living virtue joyfully. Yeah, for sure. Now, um, you know, speaking of sanctity and our goal in reaching sanctity, Damon, how does, what does theology of the body tell us about 
how uh, the dignity of the body is restored at the resurrection. Well, first, in, in the, it's part of a whole arc, and it's important to keep the salvation and redemption story connected with the origin as well as the history that we live now. That knowledge of the origin is meant to not pine and hope that we go back to, but to remember that sin didn't start the world, that sin entered the world that was created perfectly, that God created in a very ordered way, and the crown of that creation was the human person made in his image and likeness, male and female. And rightly read, that very first introduction to the human person speaks about our masculinity, our femininity, what Christopher talked about, what's stamped into our bodies as the first sign, first poet's poetic sign of what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. Now we're careful here. God is not sexual. He's neither male nor female. But the masculine and femininity that he created when he created us is a sign in this world to the deepest mystery of God that he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. But the Father's not God, the Father's not the Son, the Son is not the Father, and neither one is the Holy Spirit, right? And the, there's only one God. So that mystery that we should be pressing into and, and really meditating on, uh, really we have a sign to meditate on, and that is in all of creation and most profoundly in the human person made male and female. That alone is the sort of the meditation piece that we we're called to relook now in our life. Of, of the dignity of the person, and that's a restoration. That's a, that's restoring in the world of sin uh, eyes that can see creation for what it is, eyes that can see ourselves and to see others as sons and daughters of God, and that our sexuality, I mean, the difference of the sexes, masculine and feminine, are signs to deeper and even more profound mysteries in reality. Salvation, the redemption of the body, is that completion, if you will, of not only knowing it, not only desiring it, but then forming our lives and ordering it to it. So we begin this work of, of sanctification, of making ourselves holy, not by following the rules, as Christine was talking about, not as just doing what's right and getting in the club, or, or even um, in all respect to our older brothers in the faith, the Jews. You know, uh, it's not the law. The law doesn't, 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 law keeps you alive. The law keeps you from dying, right? I often use the analogy of the, the guardrails and the two lines that separate us from oncoming traffic. We've got all kinds of rules when you're getting a license. My two daughters got their, their 25, 30 page book on the rules of driving, and I don't remember any of that stuff, right? But uh, I have to act like I do when they're asking questions. Well, see, they get perfect with it. I don't open up that book when we're out to do a family trip. I, I, don't, I don't open up the, the rule book. It's still the law, and the laws I need to know, there's laws I need to abide by. To stay alive. But the trip and the journey is one toward a joy. It's toward a specific place. And in a real sense, the Lord Jesus Christ came as a fulfillment. Almost to say, now that you're alive, let me tell you why you're here. And the fulfillment of the law doesn't abolish one oot, one iota, one jot or tittle. What it says is, now that you're alive, you need to stay alive by following what is right, what is true. But the reason you're here... It's for that journey to redemption, to salvation, to take the natural good that we receive from God, to offer it back to him. Let him breathe his pneuma, his spirit, divinize it, and give it back to us. And this is what we do in the liturgy. Every time that we're in the Mass and we take this ordinary things of bread and wine, when we take things like oil and we offer these things, the, the work, fruit of the vine and work of human hands, and what do we do? Like good sons and daughters, we offer it back to Daddy, who happens to be the creator of the universe. And he takes this, and he says, and gives it back to us, where we literally can eat God. Woo! This, this, is, this is a big woo! And then, as if that weren't enough, that is still a reality, and it's still a sign. So the completion of this is all of creation looking for that same, give me back to daddy, give me back to daddy. And crowning of that should be man and woman saying, I'm coming back to you, daddy. I am yours and you are mine. And he takes us and he, and he takes all the wounds and all the brokenness and all the sin and he forgives, which then makes us capable of not only loving, but also receiving that same divination. Now here's where, where we have to, you have to take your shoes up a little bit. We're not talking about, again, following the rules and getting into heaven and passing go. We're talking about a divinization. 
Meaning, we don't become little gods like our, you know, our friends, the, the Mormons believe. We, but we become we sharers in the divinity of the one true God. So that his marriage proposal, spoken about in Genesis, that Paul speaks to, that he prefigured at Cana, this whole spousal analogy ends with our union with God, a one flesh union, at least a divine union. And in that, the second person of the Trinity, we become one within the Trinity. It's a wrapping up and sharing within the very divinity of God. So this is all mystery. We don't know exactly what it looks like, you know, but the point is, it's good. It's very good. And our redemption is not just one of getting wings and going into heaven, but of sharing the divinity of the one true God. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, I, let's let's move on in the discussion here. And Christina, I want to start with you this time around. You know, we have so much that has afflicted our culture today, of course. And I'm wondering, you know, theology of the body is is kind of um, centered on, in a sense, uh, Gaudium et Spes 24, where they talk about, you know, man cannot fully find himself except through a sincere gift of himself. And how does that message, which is so countercultural, this idea of self-gift um, is not a popular idea in today's culture, especially among young people. Why should young people pay attention to this message of theology of the body? So, oh, great question. Um, I truly believe, and I'm going to go back to what Damien was saying at the very beginning, um, that the root of our problems today, like our, our society, our culture, really goes back to this lack of understanding of who we are. It really goes back to this um, not understanding our identity, um, a, a lack of, of knowledge. Um, and I think that if we really realized who we were as sons and daughters of the king, pathetic and weak as we are, but really but we're really heirs to a kingdom and a throne, that would change our whole perspective. Um, the theology of the body actually offers for us very concrete and, and actual simple ways. So it's this beautiful philosophical um, anthropology, um, and there's, it, there's so much to it that is a mystery, and it's beautiful, and you can ponder, and you can pray with, but it's also just super concrete, and, um, and it offers us an actual a path, a path to understanding more and more who we are uh, as male and female, as sons and daughters. Um, if we don't pay attention to this, we're, we're going to mess everything up. Um, I think that in our society today, um, there's just such confusion. Things are so over-sexualized. I mean, and if we just, just look at the climate that we're living in and how quickly things are changing and how there's such a lack of understanding about, about marriage, about what, what it means, what is the purpose, about, about love. We're confusing these things so much. And we really won't be happy. I mean, yeah, it's great to, to live according to these principles to be good and to, to go to heaven. Um, I hope that we all get there. Um, but also, living according to the truth helps us to live more happy, full lives actually on this earth. And, um, you know, John Paul II, um, you know, said that true only, uh, what is it? He said that the, the, the chaste, only the chaste man and the chaste woman were really capable of, of true love. And I think we're all searching and longing for love. And so, and our world is so confused and our world doesn't seem to offer us an adequate way to live out that love, an adequate solution. I think that the, the only way is to, to get to the root of, of who we are, to learn ourselves and to be ready to sacrifice, to, to become a gift of self. You know, we're, we're not happy and we're not satisfied when we're just actually focusing on our, ourselves. We end up um, feeling more empty than ever. We end up feeling more lonely, more depressed. What the world has to offer does not make us happy. And I mean, that, and that's, you know, that's where I see a great hope in all of this is that we've gotten to such a point that I think, and I see this every day, that more and more young people aren't satisfied with what the world has to offer. More and more young people are, are open, are open to, to a new way being proposed. And um, I think that's what all of us are, are trying to do in our own little spheres of influence to kind of share that message of hope to, to share some kind of concrete um, ways in which we can live, to give, to, to believe in love again. You know, I mean, I, I hope with the Culture Project that we even just 
are a group of young people that can go out and say, we actually believe in love. Like, we believe in love. And you were created for a reason, for a purpose. Um, that you weren't an accident. That you were actually willed by, by God. And that you, yeah, so I mean, that, that you are heir to this, to this throne. That you have a great inheritance. And, um, but anyway, I think the theology of the body gives us a way, without being actually so verbose, um, it actually gives us a, a simple way when we look at the body and our sexuality and we see how we've so misused it. I think we have really concrete things to point out to the youth of today and to say, was this working for you? Is this, is this working for you? Is, I don't think it's working. And, 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 you know, a lot of them are, are honest enough on their own to actually admit it's not working. So they're actually, yeah. you know, we're so sick and so desperate that we're ready to try even something as radical as chastity. Um, something as radical as looking at, at the, the church is crazy. Has it really come to that, Christine? Has it come to that? <laughs> I, think, I think it has. I think it has. So, but the cool thing is, when you dig a little deeper, you realize it's, it's so beautiful. And there's so much to offer. And there's freedom and joy and love and peace and happiness. So many great things. So anyway, oh, it's, it's worth paying attention to. It works. For sure. Um, speaking of paying attention to it, Damon, you know, when we're, when we're looking for kind of roadmaps to our sanctity, uh, I, a lot of people look to theology of the body, but why theology of the body? Why can't we look toward, I don't know, canon law or look at just the catechism or, or, or some other church teaching, humanae vitae, various other encyclicals? You know, why theology of the body? What is so good about theology of the body that it will really help us in our path toward sanctity? Well, fortunately, we don't have to choose. I mean, we should be familiar with canon law. We should be familiar with the catechism. We should be familiar with all of the, the lyrics of the faith. We should know the scriptures. We should know the, the, the cultural, uh, distinctive cultural things of what it means to be followers of Jesus Christ. And the theology body in that whole panorama, in that whole uh, milieu, gives us a, a, another way of not just uh, creating something new, clearly not, but of moving us forward in our understanding of the revelation of God. God's revelation, as Benedict always reminded us, is the present moment. It's him revealing himself to us. And we have records of it in the scriptures, records of it in the history of his bride, the church. But revelation is now. It's here. The theology of the body takes us, uh, and there's, there's, some, there's some technical things I don't want to get too far in, but it does represent in a real way uh, that market shift of the Second Vatican Council. And we, we, we can't miss it as just some one other teaching in the history and the timeline of the church. The, the movement and really the, the, um, the, the mandate, if you will, of the Second Vatican Council as a pastoral council was to ask the question, how can the church be church and more church in the modern world? That's the question. They weren't sort of set to a doctrine on divinity or on the meaning of the person or any kind of angling question. They were asking the question, how do we be church in a world that no longer speaks our language? that no longer even listens and can, has the capacity to hear the gospel message because of the way that we present it. That's a bold and a humble gathering of the princes of the church, not to change doctrine, but to ask the question, how can we be more church to a world? How do we learn a new language? Not change the gospel, not change the deposit of faith, but find a way to present the faith in new ways without ab abandoning the old, making us you know, more and more dexterous, if you will, make more and more nimble. And John Paul II is a son of the council. So this theology of the body, in fact, leading up to it, his work that preceded the council, in many ways, many ways uh, predated or, or, or was a visage of that, and, and his work in love and responsibility, that book in 1960 that got him the right acknowledgement as someone who knows how to speak the language and get to the pulse of human love and God's divine plan. This theology of the body is on that same trajectory. So for us to see it as the church looking for a language so that the gospel itself can even be heard by the culture. And in that sense, John Paul brings to bear not just some new theology, but embedded in there a new philosophy, a very personalism, a very personal uh, philosophy, but a very experiential one. And putting those together in a purified way, these are secular philosophies, but putting them together in a purified way mixed with the gospels, like you take your chocolate, not take your peanut butter, we put this together, look who we got. And John Paul, as a, as a poet philosopher, is able in this beautiful way to get at that taproot again, to get at the pulse, that we're not just talking about rampant sexual abuse of the 60s. We're not talking about the latest you know, sexual morality problem. 
it's there and it's real, just like it is today. But the deeper problem is, Christina kept saying, it, we don't know who we are. And until we know who we are, we'll never ask the questions how we ought to act. In fact, we can't even ask the question how we ought to live. And John Paul, in using the new language, gets to the same beautiful gospel so that everyone can have their own personal revelation of Jesus Christ. Because it's what they all want. They just don't know they want it. Amen. Uh, Christopher, how would you say that, or would you say, rather, that the theology of the body could really be a key to the salvation of today? Without a doubt, Anna, we, we're living in a crisis. You know, you look back at 2,000 years of church history, and crisis is nothing new. But whenever the church is facing a crisis, the Holy Spirit raises up a great saint theologian to articulate the proper response to the crisis. And if anybody has eyes to see and ears to hear and just has a finger on the pulse of what's going on in the world today, the crisis today is of a sexual nature. We don't know what it means to be male and female. That's the crisis. And it's no small crisis because our masculinity and our femininity takes us to the very core of what it means to be human, right? John Paul II said it very well in Evangelium Vitae, the Gospel of Life. He says, it is an illusion. An illusion, in other words, it ain't going to happen. What's not going to happen? It's an illusion to think we can build a true culture of human life if we do not accept and experience sexuality, love, and the whole of life according to their true meaning and their close interconnection. We are living in what John Paul II grimly yet accurately described as a culture of death. And a culture of death is a culture that separates the body and the soul. That's what death is. Death is the separation of body and soul. Theology of the body is the antidote to the culture of death precisely because it's incarnational theology. It's, it's a response to the Enlightenment. It's not just a response to the sexual revolution. The errors of the sexual revolution can be traced back much further to Rene Descartes and his whole idea that the human being is a thought in a body. I think, therefore, I am. When Rene Descartes posited thought as human identity, the body became something we think about, but it was no longer understood as part and parcel of human identity. The separation of body and soul is death. And so we, you know, here we are a few hundred years later, and we think to live a spiritual life means to run away from our bodies. Pope Francis is coming out so strongly in his latest encyclical, Laudato Si, about, about this incarnational reality. He says Jesus was not a dualist. Jesus did not run away from nature. He took nature on. The second person of the Trinity brought matter to himself and wed himself to the physical eternally. The whole principle of Christianity is word made flesh, incarnation. Theology of the body is the antidote to the crisis of the day because the crisis of the day is this death-dealing separation of body and soul. Theology of the body brings us life by reuniting us body and soul. So it's critical, absolutely critical to the new evangelization. In fact, there will be no new evangelization unless there's a renewal of the church in, in, in our understanding of marriage and family life, because marriage and family life is the domestic church. If there is no renewal of marriage, there will be no renewal of the church. If there is no renewal of the church, there will be no renewal of the world. And the renewal of marriage will only happen if we return to the biblical truth that the Christian sexual ethic is not the prudish list of prohibitions so many people think it to be. It is a resounding yes to the deepest cry, that hunger of the heart that we all feel. It's a response to the true cry of the heart for true and authentic love. Well, amen, but why isn't that message getting out to the average Catholic, let alone the average person in our culture of death? I mean, obviously the culture of death has has taken over the mindset of so many in this world. I mean, how does the everyday person, you know, the non-Christopher West, the non-Damon Owens, the one that, you know, you guys you guys are, are out there preaching this, and, and it's incredible, but how does somebody watching this webinar right now 
just help affect the people around them with this teaching? Well, we cannot give what we do not have. And we, we are responsible. We have to inject this cure. We've been given the cure for the world's cancer, but we have to inject it into our bloodstream first. We, if we don't do that, we will not be able to bring it to others. So you cannot give what you do not have. There are so many ways you can dip your toe in here and just get started in learning more about the theology of the body. You have three organizations represented here that are devoted to doing this work and to helping the listeners here tonight to take that next step in learning more about the theology of the body. Just Google theology of the body as a start. Read the resources. Read, uh, listen to the CDs. Listen to the, to the audios and the, the, the talks and videos that are out there. Just go on YouTube and type in theology of the body. Just start learning. Start somewhere. If we don't take this up, I don't know how it's going to get out there. You're, you're right, Anna. There is a crisis in this trickle-down problem, right? The, the church teaches this. We have this beautiful vision, but it so rarely reaches people at the parish level. And it really is going to be a grassroots effort to get this out there. And Damon's full-time in it. Christina's full-time in it. I'm full-time in it. There's so many organizations out there that are full-time doing this work. And we need more and more people to join this movement to get it out from heart to heart so that a real revolution can happen. And Christina, how important is it to start with reaching out to young people and really create a culture of, of theology of the body? Sure. Well, I mean, the youth are our hope. The youth are hope. Um, the youth are the future. Even when we reach out to the, the youth with this message of theology of the body, of course we hope that they'll embrace it at that moment themselves and um, have a, a deeper conversion. But, you know, I, I say from my years in the classroom sharing these messages, um, I would love it if every young man and woman that heard a presentation would write that in there, say, I'm in, that's it, I'm sold, I'm transformed. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's not actually a reality. The hope is that you just start by planting those seeds and that maybe once, and I think once, the truth is spoken, it, it, it resounds in our hearts. So that maybe even when one of these, these young men and women that I've said, that myself or any of us have, have spoken to over the years, even if they hear it and somewhere it resonates and then they keep moving, and even if it's when they're in a dark, deep moment and they've actually gone down the other path, they've actually rejected this path, and they're all alone, perhaps, maybe, even in that instant, they'll remember. They'll remember that Something was proposed to them that was different, something that resounded in their heart and soul. So for me, I actually, my hope is in to come. It's like it's, it's, it's in the youth when, like, I guess our, our, our generation now, our, our teens, our, our 20-year-olds, it's, it's in all of them when they start um, getting married and having families. Like, I kind of think it's going to take a little bit more time. It's like a little more trickle. I'm just hoping that we'll have an impact will share some ounce of truth that will resonate, and, and then it'll get embraced and, and implemented. So I think it's going to take us some time, but I think that the, the young people of today, when they, they start to make their life decisions, perhaps they'll start to view marriage in a different way and family in a different way, and that they will answer those calls in light of that and, and raise their children that way, and they'll become our future priests and religious. And so... I, I sort of think it's just going to take us a, a little bit of a little bit of time, but mm -hmm. the youth obviously are, and they're also receptive. They're, yeah. you know, they're they want they want more. They want to be challenged. Yeah, for sure, uh, Damon. I want to ask you about um, contraception. There's a question that came in about talking about contraception to uh, non-Catholic Christians, but I would argue that we probably need to talk about it with just regular Catholics as well. Um, First of all, how does how does con contraception contradict who we are supposed to be as a human person, and how do we uh, convey that message to people? Particularly uh, in this question, they're asking, um, you know, with Christians at a Bible study, non-denominational non Bible study, you know, looking for biblical references on this teaching as opposed to just church tradition. Yeah, they won't find it. I mean, just to be very honest, it's not it's not a, a biblical um, understanding. It's, it's rooted in the scriptures. It's rooted in the totality, but it's not going to be found in that. That's that we just need to be very very clear about that. 
Um, and what's interesting, too, when that argument comes up often, uh, there are things that are very explicitly prohibited and still people find ways to find loopholes around it. So I think it's a little bit of a, of a, of a rabbit hole there. But uh, And by the way, I did a whole you know seminar on this, and it took about an hour to get to uh, this understanding of contraception, not because it was it was difficult, but because you, you need lovers get it. You know, uh, show me a lover, and they'll understand. You know, that's like that great uh, reflection of uh, Saint Augustine on, on the Gospel of John. That is not one that the lawyers will get. You're not going to find the chapter and verse that says uh, this is what you must do. In many ways, it's um, it's lovers who recognize the full demands of love. Uh, that love is demanding. It's not the church demanding. It's not uh, you know uh, some law all that's being imposed on you, but in the deepest aspirations of the heart to be and receive, to give and receive yourself to another, you recognize any little thing that either holds you back or keeps you from the beloved. You become super sensitive, and the deeper the love, the more self-awareness, the more mastery of ourself, the more we have the sincerity of our self-gift. Lovers, this whole process of knowledge, uh, uh, virtue, and self-gift, this changes us, and it makes us more sensitive. It makes us more aware. It lets us to see even the subtlety. You've got all kind of analogies of the city folk who spent a week in the, in, in the woods before they start hearing not just birds chirping. They start to be able to tell the difference between the birds. You know, they can tell by the, the, the weather what's, what's going to happen. It takes a while to, you know, to get the, the distractions and impediments out. Contraception is a bellwether uh, issue because it can't be imposed. It's difficult to follow the prohibition if you do it just on the law. You will always look for a loophole. That's what laws do. But again, lovers don't look for loopholes. Lovers don't say, as you know, Jason Everett says, not looking for how far can I go? What can I get away with? No, I'm not claiming rights. Uh, lovers think duty. You know, what is, what is the justice toward the other? So it, it's, it's difficult for a lover to talk to a lawyer. <laughs> it's difficult to talk about the, the prohibition of contraception and how uh, intrinsically evil it really is. We, we just, we're unequivocal in this language. It is a direct attack against marital love. It's a direct attack against the truth of love in its life-giving capox capacity. It is, a, it, is a, it is a direct assault on the one true God who has given us a high office, a high honor to literally determine who will be in heaven. <laughs> the union of man and woman and the creation of a new person that never existed before as the fruit of the union of two is the high office and honor, the duty, the, the vocation, the mission, the task given to man and woman in creation. And here we are almost throwing it right back to the creator saying, you know, no thank you. So again, that doesn't make sense to the lawyer. It doesn't make sense to the one. But the lover says, I would never, never re re rebuke love. I would never do anything to hurt my beloved. And I would never do anything to even possibly do it. And contraception represents, in its icon and its reality, the impediment to life-giving communion. Christopher, there are questions about uh, uh, sexual disorders, homosexuality. How how does how do you convey the message of theology of the body to somebody with a homosexual mindset? First of all, we have to recognize that theology of the body like the gospel itself, is a call back to God's original plan before sin distorted it. And this is something we have forgotten in the modern world. In the modern world, we have normalized our fallen condition. We think the way the world is today is the way somehow it's meant to be. Like the, we look at our experiences, our desires, and we say, God made me this way. I have a desire to do X, and God made me this way. Jesus' words here that start off the whole teaching of John Paul II and the theology of the body are so important. In the beginning, it was not so. If there's anything we can say about sexual attraction towards one's own sex, it's this. In the beginning, it was not so. There was an original plan from which, this is very important, from which we have all fallen. And this means each and every one of us are sexually disoriented by original sin. God created sexual desire in the beginning to be the very power to love in the image of God. And this is why, back to the previous question, this is why contraception is immoral, because it's a direct attack on the image of God. God's love is generous. 
it generates. And this is why God gave us genitals. A man who uses his genitals to engage with another man's genitals will never be able to generate. Genitals are meant for generating. This is what it means, part and parcel of what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. Should men learn to love other men? Absolutely. Should women learn to love other women? Absolutely. What does that have to do, excuse me, what does that have to do with our genitals? There are relationships in which genital contact is a direct affront to love. And when a man is touching another man's genitals to give stimulation, this can never be imaging God. Only the call of the two to become one flesh in that lifelong covenant of life-giving love, only that images God. Each and every one of us are in need of sexual redemption and healing in this regard because we're all disoriented. So the point is this. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. When we realize this, then it's not somebody else wagging fingers at another person saying, you're disordered, you're disordered. Guess what? We're all disordered. And we are all in need of healing. And the good news that healing is truly made available to us through the life of grace. Amen. Yeah, Christopher, Lauren asks, though, she tweeted at me this question, and would you change the term disorders? Well, we have to understand it properly. There is an order that God has established, right? There is an order, and I, I'm, we, we need to regain our, our comfort with that language. There is an order that God has established. And when we step away from that order, it is a disorder. Why is this so difficult to understand? We're, we are all disordered. I prefer, perhaps, the language of disorientation. We are all disoriented when it comes to our sexuality because we've all inherited original sin. But this is the good news. We, we, let me put it this way. It is okay for us to be broken. We're all broken. But it is not okay to call our brokenness health. And the good news of the gospel is that there is a remedy for our brokenness. If there is no remedy for our brokenness, then we can only survive by calling our brokenness health. But there is a remedy for our brokenness. It is taking up our cross and following our Savior and having the courage to die with Him so that we can live with Him. We are all in need of dying to the disordered desires we have in our life. I have a disordered desire for potato chips. It's a disordered desire. And I need to let the light of Christ into my disordered desire for potato chips so that I can rejoice in potato chips correctly. If I were to Just have... One. Just one. Six, one yes. chip. <laughs> and more than one chip. <laughs> Just not a whole bag in one sitting. Maybe over a few days. Now the point is, the point is this. If I have a sexual, an erotic desire for another man, then there's something disordered in that attraction. If I want to stimulate the genitals of another man, there's something disordered in that desire. I need to allow Christ into that disorder to untwist it. Remember, the devil doesn't have his own clay. All he can do is twist it. And if I allow Christ in there to untwist it, guess what I discover? I discover a rightly ordered love for my own sex. And this is critical. It's what every man is looking for, a rightly ordered love towards his own sex and towards the opposite sex. Rightly ordered love is liberating love. And disordered love will never bring us the happiness we desire. Well put. Well put. Uh, Christina, there's a question uh, that came in from Josephine asking... What do you say to, to non-Catholic young people when, when you're trying to reach out and transform the culture? I mean, you're going to encounter people that don't believe the same things and may even try to counter what you are saying. Well, I mean, the, the beautiful thing is that, especially with the theology of body in particular, um, it's, I mean, obviously it's part of our church's teachings and traditions, but I say this all the time, um, big C Catholic and little C Catholic, there's a difference. So, I mean, the word Catholic, Catholic means universal. And the beautiful thing is that our traditions of our big C Catholic um, are applicable to every single human heart. 
So um, really, our, all of the teachings of the church are, are made for everyone. Everyone is made to live by those teachings and principles. So we can beautifully share the church's teachings to a secular audience. And I think that's particularly what Theology of the Body gives us. Um, and, you know, Christopher so beautifully always talks about the truth being stamped into our bodies of, of our, our femininity, our masculinity. Um, that is a natural thing. That doesn't have to do with religion or, or faith. Um, marriage being like the primordial sacrament, that's something that existed before like the, the, the church, so to speak. Um, and that the relationship between male and female and husband and wife and the, um, the fruit that comes out of that in, in children. Um, so all of those things are actually quite natural um, inclinations. And I think that we can share just, just through nature and um, share the goodness of, of those things put in natural order. And also, a, I mean, a life of virtue is something that is actually admirable and, a, and appealing for every single person. So, I mean, quite honestly, in, in sharing the theology of the body um, and sharing the church's teachings on life, marriage, family, sexuality, we're, we're actually in a business selling a product that every human heart longs for, needs, desires, and wants. Uh, Damon, there was a question that came in about uh, married couples struggling with infertility and in particular struggling in, in seeing the union of man and woman and not seeing that fruitfulness um, and, and, and wondering, you know, how do you, if you just have words of wisdom for, for couples that are experiencing that kind of infertility? Yeah, I, I'll just say up front, I have not experienced that except in, in normal, uh, normal and um, uh, limited circumstances in our family. So I don't understand it in the fullness of the experience. And I want to honor that unique experience that couples have. And I've worked with um, you know, dozens of them uh, over the decades. But um, so my words are, are a mixture of that sum of experience as well as what the church speaks so beautifully about the truth of life-giving communion. I think we begin in... in the beginning again, that the communion and of marriage in particular and of children, we don't make babies. You know, it, the babies aren't created through the joining of 23 uh, chromosomes of the, the spermatozoa and the 23 chromosomes of the oocyte or 46 chromosome person. That's the that's the what we can see. But the, the, the Holy Spirit is the author and the giver of life. What we're called to be is faithful and ordered in the great gift and the use of our sexual powers. And the marriage vow is the promise to work and to order this to the specific other in the good that God has placed us in this unit, this, this high office and honor to live out this, this task. So fertility or not, this is why it's not a requirement for marriage, children that is, but the capacity, of, first of all, the, the consent to, to receive this unit, this, this great office, task, mission, honor, but also the capacity to, to carry the work out. Uh, but the actual children that come are in every circumstance, infertile or fertile, the work of the Holy Spirit. Of course, there are biological, there are other you know, physical matters in here as well. But I want to take from that the infertile couple uh, that the sense that somehow they're not uh, qualified, that their marriage is somehow defective, that somehow if this one area were, were corrected or you know, were, were changed and a child were here, you know, all of the suffering would would alleviate. Um, the, the reality is that uh, we have to wrestle with our fertility period, uh, regardless of its fecundity. And wrestling with that fertility means we have to wrestle with both the, uh, the sense that every time we come together as husband and wife, we're going to have a baby. There's a burden and suffering there. And there's the other that no matter how many times we come together, we can't make a baby. And again, I don't want to, to minimize the suffering or to talk about the, miss the distinction and uniqueness that infertile couples deal with. But we need to look at it in the broader picture instead of, instead of getting very narrow in a particular case. And in the broader case, uh, we can see that uh, fertile or infertile, every married couple shares in this duty to live out their sexual love in a way that perfects each other, themselves, and orders the marriage and each other to heaven. That's the primary goal. Whether a child comes through is the, is the, it's the, it's the, uh, the great good, right? The supreme bonum. But it's not the requirement. It's not the requirement for marriage. It's not the requirement for heaven. 
and putting that first should open our hearts large enough to say, okay, Lord, what is your will in this? What is your will in this that you brought us together? You've, you've, you've willed this either permissively or actively. How do we follow your will in this? And that really is how, you know, couples that I know of successfully navigating this, this great, this great burden, you know, keep their eyes fixed on the Lord or what is it that you're asking of me and not take on expectations of the faith that aren't there, expectations of the culture that are really false and expectations we put on ourselves about what it means to be a faithful believer in Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Uh, Christopher, I thought this was an interesting term, an interesting question, which I think will be good to, to kind of wrap up our discussions on TOB, though I do want to ask all three of you um, if you have any plans for the World Meeting of Families, which I know you do. So we'll get to that in a second. Oh, yeah. Damon, fine. I won't ask you about it then. <laughs> no, but Christopher, um, you know, Robin asks, this all sounds really great on a conceptual level, but how do we live out of the theology of the body in practical terms? The journey from head to heart with this theology is long and difficult. Uh, I often tell the story of uh, 10 years into my marriage, I was offered this lucrative book deal by a New York publisher to write a book for husbands called Loving Her Rightly. And my wife, in no uncertain terms, let me know I was not qualified to write such a book. Uh, so that was, that was an indication that, uh, you know, I had all this great theology in my head and it wasn't getting translated very, very uh, easily into my lived experience. John Paul II says, and I'll, I'll just outline it very quickly because we don't have the time, but it is, it is the essence of the answer to the question. There are three infallible and indispensable means for living the theology of the body. Number one, a life of prayer. But prayer here understood as not, name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, say your prayers. Prayer understood as becoming a longing for God. Prayer is learning to direct our desire for the infinite, toward the infinite, so that we are not misguided in our desires. Prayer means becoming a longing for God. That is the first infallible and indispensable means for living this teaching, learning how to pray. Second, frequent reception of the sacrament of confession. Why? Because we all fail. We all fall. We all make mistakes. If prayer, this is another way to put it, prayer is seeking nuptial union with the Lord. That's the words of Pope Benedict. Prayer is seeking nuptial union with the Lord. Confession is where we get naked before God. It's where we take away all our masks and all our fig leaves and we say, this is who I really am in my broken humanity, and we let the Lord love us there. The third infallible way to live this is frequent reception of the Eucharist. Because the Eucharist is the consummation of the marriage between Christ and the church. This is where we conceive eternal life. This is where we are given the grace to become the men and women we're made to be. If we are living faithfully and deeply and truly prayer, confession, and Eucharist, Living the theology of the body will flow out of us as a matter of course. But that's a big if. You know, we, it's possible to go through all the motions of prayer and the motions of the sacraments and not let the grace have its effect. Because when the grace has its effect, it starts to purify us inwardly and deeply and painfully. John Paul II talks about this. He says, in living this out, you become no stranger to painful inner purifications. But these inner purifications, he says, lead to the ineffable joy of what the mystics called nuptial union with the Lord. And then he says, how can we forget here the example of John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila? That's the destiny. That's the goal. Nuptial union with the Lord. Prayer, confession, and Eucharist. That's the infallible and indispensable means for living. Simple enough, right? Just simple. <laughs> simple, but not easy. No, 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 of course not. Well, Christopher, what um, what are you doing with the World Meeting of Families? Well, I'll be there throughout the week at the Congress, and on Thursday afternoon at 4.15, I am addressing young adults in a presentation called Desire for the Infinite, the Splendor of God's Plan for Sexuality, from 4.15 to 5.15, and then Friday morning, uh, off-site at a, a Catholic church uh, nearby, I'm addressing a group of missionaries who are going to go out into the streets and give information on the teaching of uh, Pope Francis to people in the community. And you can learn more about that at my coreproject.com website. You just click on events and you'll see where I'll be. And core is C-O-R, correct? C-O-R, Latin for heart, coreproject.com. 
www.thewildwardproject.com. All right, Damon, even though I said I wasn't going to ask you, I suppose I'll be merciful. What are you, what are you doing for the world meeting? Well, First of Theology of the Body Institute will um, have a beautiful new exhibit booth there, booth uh, 231. Happy to introduce new people and folks who are there to uh, what Theology of the Body can do, what we're getting at today. We'll be there Tuesday through Friday. I'll actually be giving a, a revival uh, in uh, Center City, Philadelphia, Monday night and Tuesday night. I'm going to shout a little bit with some, with some believers and talk some Ooh. theology of the body. And uh, Wednesday, I'll be introducing um, Bishop uh, Miller will be speaking on Wednesday around noontime, and I'll be chairing his session. And then, uh, as the Lord put it, uh, Christopher and I are in separate sessions, but I'll have a, a panel at the same time that I'll be moderating on uh, the busy family life, navigating family spirituality with, uh, with three good friends of mine. Same time, 4.15, 5.15 on Thursday. And then um, we'll be there breaking down till Friday, and then I'll, I'll sleep for a week. <laughs> Wait, so you and Christopher are going to be in competition? Oh, man. Oh, no competition in the Lord, huh, brother? It's uh, <laughs> diversity. There's different strokes for different folks. How about that? Exactly. Is the Culture Project doing anything with the world meeting, Christina? Oh, we'll be there. Uh, we'll be there in full force. All of our um, missionaries actually just came in town the other day, and we're in the midst of our, our fall training. So 30-some of us will, will be there the whole week. Um, we'll, we have a booth. And so we'll be at the Congress. Please stop by, visit us. Um, we'll also be doing little things along the way. And actually, Thursday happens to be the big day. Um, Thursday <laughs> evening, we are, are putting on a, a little evening called Wine, Wisdom, and What Now? And the, the whole point of this evening is actually to, ta to tackle the tough questions of today. So basically, almost like that last question uh, put to Christopher, you know, all this sounds so beautiful, but, you know, how do we really do this, and how do we tackle the difficult questions today? And I'm so happy to announce we have an awesome, awesome panel um, that is going to be present. We have um, Jason and Kristalina Everett. We have Matt Frad. We have Lila Rose. We have Brian Butler. Um, is that everybody? I think so, yeah. So um, sorry if I left anybody out. But um, so that evening, um, that starts 6.30. Uh, so we'll have a meet and greet, and then at 7.30, I think actually 8 o'clock, we'll begin our, our panel. So it's, it's an evening for um, wine, wisdom, fellowship, relaxing, um, and uh, we're looking to get anyone that works with the young people there, so um, people in different diocesan positions, and also um, anyone that was working promoting this, these messages, the Church of Teachings on Life, Marriage, Family, Sexuality, and, uh, and also looking for young adults to come out to do that. Very cool. And where can people plug? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. One more plug. I, you know, I we're suppose. Talking about this great topic. It's not self-promoting. Uh, but this world meeting of families is so rooted in theology of the body. Again, just making sure people understand this isn't a boutique. It's not a niche. It's not some new jack uh, Catholicism. Uh, you've got to get copies of the preparatory catechism, the document written for this world meeting of family that is so rich in theology of the body. Love is our mission. That's what it's called. The family fully alive. Ten chapters, easy to read, beautiful salvation story, but a way to see how theology of the body is so central to restoring this dignity of the family. Got to get that catechism. Love is our mission, absolutely. And uh, if you want to listen to the Sunrise Morning Show, because you, like me, don't get to go to Philadelphia, uh, we'll, of course, be uh, checking in with all kinds of people throughout the week to get updates and whatnot. And you can uh, listen to the Sunrise Morning Show from 6 to 7 on EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. And uh, if you go to sacredheartradio.com, you can download our app on iPhone, iPhone, iPhone or Android, and uh, you can listen to all three hours of the show. And I hope that, that maybe the three of you all might be able to find some time to uh, give us a quick update on how things are going for each of you uh, throughout next week. So be looking for an email from me. I will be in touch. Um, so thank you so much for... For this and I apologize to the people whose questions we didn't get to there were so many and uh, we want to be of course considerate of your time but um, you definitely want to be looking for the recording of this session which will be coming out we have your emails so you'll you'll get a link for this and please share it far and wide because I mean gosh you've listened to these three talk about it it is so important for our culture to learn the theology of the body. So Christina Barber, Damon Owens, Christopher West, thank you so much for being here. So welcome, um, I, was, I was hoping we could end with a glory be real quick. Very good. All right.
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you all. Good night. God bless you. Bye.